would mean it would be a good time. I think last week when I was at 631, Susan scolded me because I was running one minute late. So I wanted to be right on time today. So there yes. couldn't be any scolding. <laughs> Is that okay? It's good. It's good. Okay. All right. Well, since Nina just took a huge exam, which she doesn't have the results back, it might be really, really good if she opened us in prayer tonight. Mm. Mm. Okay. Oh. Dear Lord, we thank you for this group. We thank you for your word and how you teach us through your word. And we just ask that as we discuss truth and all truth is your truth, Lord, help us to um, know how we can talk to unbelievers, Lord, about you and, and to get them to come to salvation. And we just ask that everything we say and do um, glorifies you and just, just help us to have open open minds and open hearts, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. That was a good prayer. Thank you. Well, so week number two of truth. And if you remember when we finished last week, we had this whole hour of discussion about truth, but it never got defined. And so we're actually going to start tonight, you know, defining truth. But let's see, what did we cover last week? Remember last week, we actually talked about this description and discussion about objective morals. You know, this belief that morality itself is universal. It isn't up for interpretation. There is a right answer that's not human derived. We talked about that, had a couple questions, lots of comments on that. We uh, had a story, the story of the Nuremberg trial, the defense and the response. <laughs> and if you remember the Nazis defense about, hey, you know, we didn't do anything wrong. We just followed the leaders rules and laws and guidelines. And then the, the uh, prosecution's response to that is, hey, listen, there is a law above the law. There is a law above the law, a law that comes above what humanity has and what humanity does. And then we spent some time in the scripture itself and we we looked at uh, what Jesus said in his own claim as to the source of truth, he himself. And we, we went through the scriptures, John 14. We reread verses one and two, but ultimately we gravitated toward John 14, six, which, which he tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And we talked about what that means. What did Jesus mean when he uh, claimed to be the truth? And then the classical story in John 18 with Pontius Pilate and this bantering, this argument, this debate between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, uh, and where we ultimately, Pilate asked the question in John 18, 38, what is truth? What is truth? And so the last thing that we really talked about last week was in this today, in this society that we live in, one of the attributes of our society today is what's classified as a post-modernism society. And that's a claim and a belief that truth, uh, they, they deny that truth can even be known. And we had some discussion last week is, do we believe that truth can be known and why? And so we kind of finished on that. So we had these stories, we had these, these, this biblical perspective. And so today we actually want to start really describe what truth is. And a classical way, or one way of many ways, you can actually define or describe what something is, is you can actually describe it by the antithesis, what it is not. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to first talk about what truth is not, and then that's going to make the universe smaller, make it smaller, and then I'm going to define what truth is within that context of these things that it's not. All right, you with me so far? Mm -hmm. This, this approach is actually a fairly common way in which you can identify, you know, the root cause of a problem is to identify what something is not. And so as I go through these examples, I'll try my best to limit any snarkiness or sarcasm because some of these are kind of silly, but it's, it's things that people actually, you know, believe and tout. So I'm just trying to expose what we see out there around there. And so the first one is this. Truth is not simply whatever works, or stated differently, truth, truth is not pragmatism, like an ends versus means approach. So what do I mean? So I mean that in reality, you can tell a lie 
and the lie can appear to work. It can appear to be valid, um, but they're still lies and they're not the truth. All right, I'll give you an example. Say a person believes that earning much money is the most important thing in one's life. They believe that, they believe that's the truth. Um, that belief for that person may be true, um, and it actually may even be a useful belief. But, and that person may actually have actions that are guided by that belief. So all, all of those attributes can happen. But let's say another person, another person has a different view and thinks money is of minor importance and thinks that having family and friends is the most important thing. Well, once again, that, that person may, may derive objectives and goals within life in which how to live and act using that as that person's truth, but neither one of those is an objective truth. It's based on a thinking or a believing of what that particular person says. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. This is a pragmatic truth. I'll give a silly example. The example is that um, I believe it's the truth that my car runs on water. Uh, because when I filled it up, it was almost to the top and I had some extra water and I topped it off in the, in the top of the, of the gas tank and it still ran. <laughs> well, I, I've reached a long, wrong conclusion, obviously. Um, so a pragmatic truth. Any comments on that? Oh. All right, let's change the channel a little bit. Truth is not simply what is understandable or what is coherent. And so, you know, people can gather, they can form, they can have discussions, they can come up with theories, they can come up with conspiracy theories based on some falsehoods and where they all agree to tell the same false story. And so, but that doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true if you have groupthink. You know, think about uh, conspiracy theories, think about you know, I don't know if you know this, a piece of trivia, there's 2000 volumes that have been written on JF Kennedy's assassination with all kinds of conspiracy theories associated with them. Have we heard of any conspiracy theories related to COVID-19 or vaccine effectiveness? Can you think of anything else in modern, in modern news that, that you, you say people spin things up to create a conspiracy when the facts don't actually represent it? And another example, um, and I don't know if this is a different category, um, for say 300 years, Newtonian uh, theory of gravity was considered to be the truth. And it wasn't until, until Einstein came along and, and came up with the Einstein theory of, of gravity, you know, uh, general relativity, which, which is now held to be the current version of truth for gravity. And there seems to be a, at least a, a query, um, you know, as they're trying to figure out the, the formula for everything, the theory for everything, right? They still don't really understand even gravity. They can characterize it. Newton, Newton started the journey. Uh, Einstein raised the order of magnitude better, which has gotten us closer, but still we don't actually know what the answer is. Have you ever watched any of those alien conspiracy shows? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Joe, I don't think those are conspiracy. I think those are factual. Well, and that's, the, <laughs> that's part of the reason I bring it up is that there is some that is factual. And some of those people are very sincere about not knowing certain, you know, what, what experiences they may have had. But there's some of it that's factual. And then you have a few that run it all the way down the football field. And it's like, eh, just because you don't know what that light was, doesn't mean it was little purple guys flying around in a saucer. <laughs> and you kind of, you kind of uh, talked notionally about this, and that is that oftentimes we will mix uh, truth, elements of truth, with elements of conjecture, with elements of theory, with elements of belief. And for, as we're trying to discern, you know, the bottom line, it's, in many cases, it's almost impossible to do, right? Because you can't actually separate these this data into these appropriate categories. Except for another, aliens, another, aliens is the exception. Another concept I would say is how much of the 
news you get throughout the television and radio all day long, where much of what's said is nothing more than spin and efforts to make things true or sound true, which are simply figments of people's imagination. You see that and hear it all day long. You sure do. We sure do. And we're going to touch upon a couple other threads of that as we go through this discussion today. And so another element of, of what truth is not, truth is not what makes people feel good. Unfortunately, bad news can be true. Certainly. Right? Yep. Um, you're, at a, you're at a doctor, and actually this has happened recently, at least in people that I know, and you, you're, way, you're wanting good news. Um, and the doctor actually tells you the wrong results of the test to make you feel better. It's not true, or it doesn't give you the full information associated. It doesn't truly inform you of that. So making you feel good does not make something true. All right, that should, be, that should be pretty straightforward. Here's yeah. something that, if I go back to, to Dad's comment a little bit, is that oftentimes we get presented as truth um, the results of a poll, an opinion poll. So it's one thing to report that the results of the poll yielded this result. It's the other thing to take it another step. And because of that result, that means that position in which the poll reached is the truth. That's not true. Does that make sense? So 51% of people who, who agreed on something can absolutely reach a wrong conclusion. Certainly. Right? <clears throat> Here's an extreme it's example. It's the goal many times to present <clears throat> so much of what's going on, trying to make people believe that which is not true. And, and that's really <clears throat> the whole point behind their uh, conversation. So I'm going to tout to you um, that Islam, uh, the religion of Islam is true because of this statistic. 99.4% of the population of Iran is Muslim, and therefore Muslims uh, has to be true. So just because I have a preponderance of a belief in something and take a poll as a result of that, that does not make it true. All right, that should be pretty clear. Here's something that may be a little bit harder. One, this is that truth is not what's comprehensive. A detailed, lengthy presentation um, can still result in a false conclusion. Yep. And so an, an example of that would be uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. It's actually turning out that as we get smarter, kind of to Nina's comment about Newton, as we get smart, smarter on biology, and, and learning about the complexity of life itself, we're learning that the assertions, you know, Darwin wrote down actually a pretty good, did a pretty good job of writing down what he knew with the available information in there. And then he reached some theories and conclusions that had been taken the ball and run with it turned out not to be true. So the fact that he wrote the or origin of species, which contained 502 pages of technical information, that doesn't make it true. So something that's comprehensive does not make it true. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got something. Just because you hear the news on television doesn't make it new, uh, true either. You get a lot of false news on television. You know, so actually, Carol, you, you, that comment that you said and, and uh, tied in with the comment my dad said a couple minutes ago, you know, one thing I would encourage everyone here is that try to find sources of news and information that are A, reporting news and not opinion, sometimes right. very, very hard to do. And the other thing is, is that there is, there is biases on virtually every news. And there's a few news sources that are actually claimed to be, or actually um, have um, um, experience or actually have, um, have demonstrated the ability to be able to be neutral in their position or slightly to the left or slightly to the right and not trying to spin the news. And so I would encourage you to seek those kinds of sources. And I'll give you a couple uh, that come to mind. One would be uh, Associated Press, uh, UPI would be another one. Um, Wall Street Journal, slightly to the right. It's not very, it's not exactly neutral, but slightly to the right. I'm gonna mess these up, BBC and Reuters. I think it's BBC that is slightly, is neutral and, and um, Reuters is slightly to the left. 
So if you want something that's in the middle of the spectrum, those five sources are actually pretty good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But great points. Oh, great point, Carol. All right, here's one. Truth is not defined by what is intended. So just because you intend something, um, that doesn't make it true. Here's an example. Who remembers back in 1985, Coca-Cola created this new product that they thought it was the best version of cola that could ever be invented and they introduced the new Coke. Remember that? It became a total flop. I remember that. <laughs> but, but they believed, they had great intentions. They, they believed it was going to be the best. They did marketing. They compared it to Pepsi. They made, looked to see why Pepsi was stronger. They did all this stuff. They released it. How long was it on the market before they brought classic Coke back? A year. Three months. Three months. Wow. Three months. Wow. Wow. Three months. Wow. Imagine the amount of money they wasted for the company. Yeah. Mm. So the good news for dad is he doesn't like Coke. He likes Pepsi. So he didn't have to go through the experiment. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All, All I'm right. saying is the Woodruff Art Center wouldn't exist without Coca-Cola. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Can I ask a question here? <clears throat> the visuals that I'm seeing is what happens when a person speaks, their picture comes up while yeah. they're loud in the microphone, and when they stop, someone else's comes up because they're speaking. Are you on yes, your they... computer or are you on your iPad? Oh, computer, yeah. If you click on the top right, there is a little thing that says view. I see that. I've got that up there all the time. I have a okay. very large monitor. Click on gallery and that'll show you everybody. Okay, I'm looking at yeah, gallery. I'm looking for the word. I don't see the word. Yet. Yeah. You got to hover. You got to hover to You got to hover to the right. Yeah. Where, where it says view and click on view. Yeah. Okay, I got it. I got okay. it. Okay. Yeah. I see it. Thank you. Okay. How about on my phone? Because I only see one person. And that's when they're talking. Yeah. Your phone doesn't have a screen big enough. It so it's only going to show you one at a time. Yeah. Okay. If you move it to the side, cool. you can see the people. Okay. Move it to the left. Yeah, this is you better. Thank you. you. Thank you. For scrolling and you can see people, Carol. Yeah. Turn it to the left and you can see people. Okay, so the next one is one that everyone has already talked about in one way or the other tonight, but I just wanted to put it succinctly in words. Truth is not simply what is believed. A lie believed is still a lie. The news telling you a non-truth is still a non-truth. Actually, I wanted to ask y'all a question. How many of you know that I was trained as a brain surgeon? <laughs> really? Yeah, no one's buying that, are you? No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I probably, have, in that I probably <laughs> have the best opportunity to know how untrue that is. All right, I'll have to retract that then. Yeah, I have to admit that was a lie. Yeah. All right, so the last one is this. Truth is not what is publicly known or proven. What is publicly known. What do I mean by this? A truth can be privately known. For example, if I knew the location of a buried treasure, I know the location, that is the truth. The fact that you don't know that truth doesn't make, mean it's not a truth, right? A person who's convicted of a crime by a jury may still be innocent, right? Sure. And so yeah, all, all of these elements are, are all, you know, when these, when these are used in the right way, good things happen. When they're used in, in deceptive or controlling ways, bad things happen, all right? So what we're trying to do in as terms of how we live our life is one is be ones that we actually are conveying, conveying and communicating the truth. And one is being um, at least observant or being listening for when some of these things come across that are that are not the truth because of how they're being used and told. So most of these things shouldn't have provided any kind of really, oh, wow, I never thought about that. But they just kind of shape around what truth is that I'm going to get to in just a second.
Any comments about this before we go into what truth is? All right, so if we're going to talk about truth, we ought to talk about the Greek and the Hebrew versions of truth because that's actually what we use. And since I'm going to butcher this word, that Nina will then make sure that I get it right from this point forward. The Greek <laughs> word for truth, the Greek word is aletheia. Aletheia. And that means to unhide or hiding nothing. And that's actually a very interesting word, aletheia for truth means to unhide or hide nothing. And it, what it's really trying to communicate is the truth is always there, it's always open, and it's available for all to see with nothing being hidden or obscured. There is a truth. So no matter how someone tries to spin it, there is a truth. And that's what Aletheia is trying to bring out with their, um, yes, that is correct. You even spelled it right, uh, uh, Ashley, that's correct. Aletheia. So it, it's a belief, a belief is true if it corresponds to reality. So what about Hebrew? The Hebrew word of truth is emeth, E-M-E-T-H. Means something, this means firmness, constancy, duration. And this is implying an everlasting substance, is something that can be relied upon. So here we have the Greek and the Hebrew that it's telling us something that is unhidden, not hiding anything. It's open for all to see that has a, a, a lastingness, a, a, a constancy to it, is how the Greeks and the Hebrews think about it. So I've thought about what, how, how what might we use the truth in society that everyone should truly understand what it means. Well, what about when we go to court? And when we go to court, one of the things that happens as a witness is what? You take an oath. Mm -hmm. What does the oath say? Well, in many, many cases, if not most cases, you, you uh, raise your hand and repeat after me with the Bible in hand, and you, you say, I swear by the Almighty God that the evidence I shall give to the court in case shall be the what? Truth. 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 The whole what? Truth. And nothing but the what? Truth. Truth. So would you think that when witnesses get up on the stand, they understand those words that they're saying? Well, if you have an elementary school education or better, you better know what that means, right? So that's the expectations. And in fact, if it's believed that there's no competency associated with that person because they don't understand that, then they wouldn't call them forward as a witness. They expect the words that come out of that person's mouth represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So what is truth? So truth is three things. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. And I'll go into each of these in a little bit of detail. Truth is what matches its object. Truth is simply telling it like it is. So it corresponds to reality, it matches its object, and it's like telling it like it is. So let me go into each of those. The first thing, corresponds to reality. It corresponds to what is. It corresponds to, is it real? It corresponds to nature. It matches, it matches the, the object and, it, and, it, and is known by the, the person that's referring it to, the reference. And I'll give you an example. You're in a classroom, Susan. You're in a classroom. You're teaching. You're facing the class. And you may say, now the only exit to this room is on the right as you're standing facing the class. So the class is looking at you and they're facing the teacher. The exit door may be on their left because they have a different perspective, but it's absolutely true that the door for you, the teacher is on the right. So it matches the person saying it and it corresponds to reality. That's the first definition of truth. It is real. You with me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. The second is truth matches its object. So what I mean by that? So it may be absolutely true that a certain person may need so many milligrams of a certain medication, but another person may need more or less of that same medication to produce the desired effect. All of us should be able to relate to that, right? 
Mm -hmm. So this is not relative truth. It's an example of how truth must match its object. It would be wrong and potentially dangerous for a patient to request that their doctor give them an inappropriate amount of a particular medication or that say there's any medication for a specific ailment would do. That is a truth that matches its object. Okay, with me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Here's the third one. Truth is simply telling it like it is. It's the way things really are and any other viewpoint is wrong. It's telling it like it is, right? It's not spinning it, it's not shaping it, it's not doing any of those things that truth is not, it's telling it like it is. Any comments on what truth is? I would say one thing to consider is that people may very well be telling it like it is as they believe it and still not be true. So that's also gotta be considered. Absolutely. So we have to go back to the things that truth is not. Right. And, it, and if we can discern and pass it through the filter of those things that truth is not, you know, you can tell it like it is as a lie, or you can tell it like it is as the truth. If you tell it like it is as a lie, unfortunately, that's not the truth. Okay, yeah, that my, is not. My point, my point being, Rick, if I can say it, is that people may be telling the truth as they know or believe it, and simply isn't the truth. Not that, that is true. That's like the hidden treasure example. Right. I think that the hidden treasure is located over in Orlando, but in fact, I know that it's located in St. Augustine. Um, right. And just because you believe it's in Orlando, that doesn't make it true. Right. Exactly right. Now, here's the unfortunate thing. Here's where the, 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 uh, the volume has been turned up in society today, because what we have in society today is that people are trying to say various aspects of there is no truth. And so we've, we've already spent like an hour and a half between the last two sessions describing elements of why there is truth. But what are these philosophies today that try to explain no truth? Now, as I, as I describe these, here's one thing I want you to keep in mind. Each one of them are self-defeating in, in their own definition. And I'm going to describe what that means. The other thing I want to say is this. Each of these philosophies that I'm going to describe, we could spend weeks on talking about it and studying them. And I will even go so far as this, that when you use these philosophies as they intended to be used, not as that they've been spun in society today, there's actually some value in these philosophies. So I'm not debunking and refuting these. I'm just debunking and refuting how they're used in society today to express biases and other motivations. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so the first one is this. It's called skepticism. And the principle of skepticism denies and doubts all truth. Denies all truth, skepticism. It includes the one cannot know about anything. So ponder this. So play on words, so I'll say it carefully here. Is the skeptic skeptical of skepticism <laughs> does, does the skeptic doubt his own truth claim if the if the truth claim is this there is no truth i doubt all truth is the very fact that he's making that statement is that a skeptical statement or an absolute statement which one is it it's self-defeating where are you coming from right someone who's an agnostic says you can't know the truth. And again, in a self-defeating nature, is it, is it, if you're saying you can't know truth, is that one truth that you claim to know that there is no other truth other than that one that you just said? Okay, that doesn't make sense. Can personify. Okay. So we'll call that one extreme case, the skepticism, yeah. doubt all truth, all truth is skepticism. Here's one, the next step, relativism. Relativism says that all truth is relative. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Well, gosh, once again, is that a self-contradictory statement? Is the statement itself an absolute claim that all truth is relative? And if it is an absolute claim, then apparently all truth isn't relative because you've just made an absolute claim. 
So again, it's a self-defeating. And here's an example. So there is a valid relative truth. A valid relative truth would be, I like chocolate ice cream. You may like vanilla. You'll come back and say, well, I like vanilla ice cream. Well, relative to, to your position, that's a true statement for you, but it's not an absolute truth. It is a relative truth. But when you say there is no absolute truth, that's where it all breaks down. Not objective, not objective truth. So here's a question for us. Our morals, are the morals we have relative or absolute? Hmm. Hmm. Well, according to the Bible, <laughs> that makes them more absolute than relative. So if we go back to the Nuremberg trials that we talked about last week, is there a law above the law? Can I just make up whatever law that I want and it becomes, it becomes the truth? No. In fact, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote his whole book on moral, uh, mere Christianity, starting off with that core premise about good and bad, uh, 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 truth and non-truth. Another question, is Jesus true or not? Yes, true. Yes, he is. He is it's the not truth. Relative. <laughs> It's not you relative. Can't, uh, you can't just say that. Otherwise, people can say Buddha is the truth or Muhammad is the truth, you know? And then we're back to majority rule. That's absolutely uh -huh. right. And so here's the here's the premise of what you just said there. The if if you if you have different worldviews and you have different perspectives on any particular topic, to make the truth claim and, and expect it to stand on itself, it can't. You have to go deeper than that, right? You you have to go deeper than that. And there's and then there's elements elements of there is lots of of, of fact that as we just as we're trying to discover what the truth is, is lots of lots of fact in which we can discover and discern and 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 use that as a basis for our claim. Um, and you use that as part of the discussion, but, but ultimately, ultimately we all have to agree to this. There is a truth. So if, if a, a Jehovah's witness and a Christian and a Mormon and a Buddhist and a Hindu all make claims of truth and the truths are not, are not compatible with each other, then you have the law of self-contradiction. You can't have one side being the truth and another side being the opposite of that and also being the truth. They contradict each other. It has to be one or the other. And so none of your point is, is spot on and, it, and it's non-trivial as well as we all know, is when you take it beyond you know, the claim of truth and the proof of truth, there's a whole dimension that goes beyond that, right? But- yeah. At the key and at the core, there is a truth. There is a truth. Whether well, you know I, it or not, it doesn't matter. I, I kind of liken it to a, a, a Jenga tower, right? Simplistic view, but it's the foundation. You have a strong foundation. If you try to remove that foundation, what are you building on? Right? We can make these suppositions. We can make these deceptions. And you see it in, in, in modern day where uh, I was talking about it to my mother earlier today. Uh, if you remember the company Theranos, it was valued at a billion dollars. They had no product. They absolutely lied about the product. That was proven in court recently, I believe. Yes, yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can build these lovely and they lovely constructs they sound great but if you have no basis it just all falls in on itself you know that's one thing that happened go on Naya. that's the key what what joe just said is the basis is evidentiary support yes yeah. yes and here's what what a problem that we're facing today we're about 30 years behind europe in terms of of the society changes and moral degradation you know that's happened or the secularization is probably a better way to say it is that a conversation that you would have had when Andy Griffith was on TV in the 50s and 60s 
and a conversation that you would have had 20 years ago and a conversation that you would have had today, the foundation's been shattered over the time. And so the conversation that, that we would have in the 50s and 60s, there would be some core beliefs and principles that you would start on that it would actually have a foundation that's higher than where it is today. That's, that would be my, my assertion. And so you can't assume that someone is on the same, has the same level of foundation. The foundation is strong when you have a conversation with someone. You have to start the conversation and where you actually have a foundation and then build from there in the discussion in terms of discovering what truth is. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. A lot of sense. Yeah. Not saying that it's easy because it isn't easy to do that, but when, you're, when we're having these kinds of conversations and we're, when we're seeking the truth in self and we're building on our own foundation, that nothing different there. As we build on our own foundation, we're starting with something that we don't want to be on sand. We want it to be on rock, as Jesus would say. Mm -hmm. Right? We don't want the foundation to settle. <coughs> All right, so I brought this term up a couple different times. It's postmodernism. And postmodernism, and we live in a, in a society right now that has this belief pretty predominantly, and they're affirms that there's no particular truth. It actually was uh, known, or it was made known or illustrated um, by Frederick Nietzsche. And it actually denies that the truth can be known. And that's real scary, that the mm -hmm. truth can't, can, the, the, the claim is the truth can't be known. You can't know it. Um, but once again, you're making an assertion of an affirmation. There is no truth. You're stating that as an absolute, that there is no truth. Is that an absolute in itself? It's self-defeating. So these very core premises, we have to be careful in terms of what they're actually claiming and whether or not their claim itself is actually negating their own position. It can't stand up under its own claim. Now, if there's no truth, what's the opposite of that? <clears throat> the opposite of that is pluralism. And that means all truths are equally valid. So let me ask you this. Have you ever heard or, or seen in discussion that there is no truth, um, all truths are valid, there is no particular truth, um, all truth is relative? I mean, you hear threads of this in conversation all over the place. Now, what's the reason for that? It's interesting when you study the philosophy of these, the philosophy of these actually have some interesting perspectives that when they're used within their, in, in their, their view in which they're designed to be applied to actually has some value. But when they're expanded upon to make this grandiose, global, all-encompassing view that you can't have truth or all truth is relative or all truth claims are valid, it just it defeats itself by making 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 these really preposterous claims. All claims are equally valid. So you're telling me that a woman who's now pregnant, so someone says a woman's pregnant, sees that she's pregnant, someone else says the woman is not pregnant, which is true. That's a law of self-contradiction. They can't both be true. Mm -hmm. They're not equally valid. So these are all ploys. All these philosophies have this objective in order to defer and deflect actually seeking what the real truth is. And that's where our society right now is actually focusing on. So any comments about that? So why is all this truth under attack? Why? Why is this happening? If you claim to have a truth, um, some may assert that you're narrow-minded. But, but I would argue. Saying, are you on, saying I can't identify myself in a rhododendron bush? <laughs> uh, um, well, <laughs> um, yeah. Why don't you do that, Joe? Come on, that's my truth, Rick. Right? Are you a male or a female rhododendron yeah. bush? Is the question. I think they're both. This, this an azalea. <laughs> a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the current um, trend toward relative truth 
is kind of a, uh, an excuse to uh, behave as you would wish. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's valid. That's valid. Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. You know, and, and it's easier to justify behavior that otherwise would not be justified. It is a rationalization and a justification principle. I agree. And it's uh, it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about um, corporations, ESG, you know, environmental environmental rules, sustainable governance. The same people that would dictate a very um, hardcore truth about bad guy companies spewing forth carbon dioxide uh, will turn right around and say um, relative truth compared to say sexual activity or drugs or abortion or that is all very relative, but they, but they have some pretty hardcore um, lines in the sand about, you know, um, carbon dioxide emissions, you know. Yeah, and from about some of those no carbon dioxide. Trying to get others to accept their premise of what is the most important thing to me, what, what you're speaking about. And there's a lot of important things that they're not in any way involved in. And they're putting too much emphasis on things that may be questionable, personal opinion. Yep. Yep. So be you know, truth, the, the claim that if you, if you seek the truth that you're being narrow-minded, um, that's, it's actually kind of unfortunate because the reality is truth is narrow. You know, two and two plus two doesn't equal five. Two plus mm -hmm. two has an answer. Um, mm -hmm. or, or another attack might be an, an arrogance attack. If you're claiming that some, someone is right, then that means you're claiming someone else is wrong. Well, I'll go back to the math question again. Is it arrogant for a math teacher to insist on only one right answer on an arithmetic problem? Of course not. Is it <laughs> arrogant for a locksmith to state that only one key will open a locked door? Well, I, in fact, I think most people want their locks to only be opened by one key, the key yeah. that they have. Right. It's not arrogant. Or maybe, maybe truth, you know, excludes people with different positions. Well, again, it's, truth is, is narrow, it is, it's exclusionary. I mean, I'll use the same math example. All the answers other than four are excluded from the solution of two plus two. Yes. It's exclusive. <laughs> so, Here's the one that's the most troubling um, in terms of the attack on truth. It's this claim that truth is not important. It's a matter of sincerity. It's, is truth is immune um, to sincerity or belief or desire. You know, so for example, sincerity, it doesn't, you know, truth, it's not important. It's just sincerity that matters. Well, let me challenge you with this. If someone ingests poison sincerely believing it's lemonade will still suffer the unfortunate effects of the poison. Mm -hmm. Truth is the truth. Or a belief. Truth is immune to belief. It doesn't matter how much someone sincerely believes a wrong key will fit a door. The key still won't go in and the lock won't be open. So it's not about sincerity. It's even not about desire. Okay. Truth should be considered non-emotional, non-feeling, and representing reality. That's what it should be. So if someone makes this claim, you know, that, you know, you're making a, clue, a truth claim and you're being narrow-minded in your claim of truth, how do you respond to that? Okay, you're right. I'm wrong. You're always right. There is no truth. That's what we should say. No. <laughs> No. I can't say that. You can still have your truth. I mean, listen to other people, but you can agree with them. Yeah. What's really important about what you just said there, Lori, is that one of the things that we've we've lost a lot in our society is that having a different opinion and a different thought or perspective on something is actually beneficial. 
to actually talk it through and, and hear sides of a story. And it actually is illuminating. It is, in my mind, the, the best, most truest form of diversification is to be able to have people be able to share different ideas. But ultimately, when we're talking about the truth, there is a truth. We can't lose fact of that. And if we don't know the truth and we're trying to discover the truth, then having these kinds of discussions and, and open openness in terms of understanding different perspectives, it's huge value in that. Huge, huge value. It's not about being dogmatic. You would have a, a lot of people <coughs> say that the only truth <coughs> is scientific truth and that any other kind of claim, um, you know, say about, you know, Jesus or morals or ethics or many other things uh, cannot be put in the realm of uh, objective truth. Yes, exactly. I mean, exactly right. There's this philosophy and it's called um, uh, logical positivism. Um, and, it, and it's a scientific position that says that truth claims must only be one of these three positions, uh, only one of these three ways. One is by uh, tautology, which is really just saying the same thing with different words. All bachelors are unmarried men. Okay, that's a truth. But it's just, it's just saying the same thing a different way. But here's the point that you brought up. It's got to be empirically verifiable, testable via science. That's a key tenet of logical positivism. Now, unfortunately, this same philosophy says to the logical positivist, all talk about God and religion is nonsense because it can't be experimented on. It can't be tested. It can't be verified. And to take that one step farther on the topic of science, science, um, the belief that science can make cl truth claims um, actually miss other realms where science is imp impotent. It can't, it can't address. Here's an example. Science can't prove the disciplines of math and logic. Why? It actually uses them and presupposes them actually to carry out their own work. Science can't prove metaphysical truths such as minds other than my own and they exist. That's it. I can't prove anything about your mind, about what you're thinking. Science can't prove the truth in morals and ethics. You can't use science to prove the Nazis were evil. Can't do that. Science is actually incapable of stating truths that are aesthetic positions about the beauty of a sunrise, about the beauty of a painting that Roger did. Mm -hmm. Science can't do that. Mm -mm. So anyone who makes the statement right to Nina's point, science is the only source of objective truth, have just themselves made a philosophical claim. That statement cannot be tested by science. Right. Another self-defeating claim. Exactly right. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it is, this all filters our perceptions anyway. When we, when we state a truth, I state a truth, I'm stating my opinion. I'm stating my understanding of that truth. Not necessarily what is, in my mind, the actual absolute truth that, that you're referencing. And a great way to test what you just said is if you can, if you, if I'm listening to you and I listen to what you say, and if I could put, inject in the words of your sentence, I think, I believe, I presuppose, I opine, right? That just affirms what you just said, that what you're stating is a position and the position may be valid for lots of different reasons, but to think of it as an absolute truth, it is not. So, you know, we spent all this time about talking about truth. So why is it important? Why do we care? You know, many people say there is no truth. Why do we even care about it? And actually, very pragmatically, there's a couple real good reasons for it. One is that life has consequences for being wrong. Mm -hmm. If you get the wrong amount of medication, you don't have the truth in the dosage of your medication, it could kill you. 
Mm -hmm. If you have an investment manager that makes the wrong monetary decisions, it can impoverish a family. It's the truth. There's, if you board the wrong plane, it's going to take you somewhere you don't want to go, unless you intended to board the long, wrong plane. It has consequences. But now, why are, we, why are we talking about this on a Wednesday evening? Because nowhere are the consequences more important than in the area of faith. We all know that eternity is an awful long time to be wrong. Amen. Amen. So let's finish it up with God and the truth. So we've talked about how truth permeates the word, shows up in the Old Testament, shows up in the New Testament. Jesus referred himself as the truth. We saw the truth on trial with Pontius Pilate and with the unrighteous deception that was attacking the righteous, the, the witnesses that weren't telling the truth, the questions that were being asked, the, the Sanhedrin and what they were doing all relative to it. So we believe, we believe that the word of God represents the truth and lots of reasons for that. There's facts based on it. There's history based on it. There's lots of reasons for that. Our own experiences, our own experiences validate the truth and how we should live and how we should think and how we should grow closer to Christ. Not only is the truth of facts and what the word teaches us, but the experiences that we've had in our own lives. And so this link, this link between truth and righteousness and growing to be more like Christ each and every day, this link between falsehood and unrighteousness, the Bible tells us, it gives us a lot of examples uh, in terms of this link that exists between these things. I'll give a couple of them here. In 2 Thess Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, says this. It says, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. It's revealing to us that we can understand, we can, be, we, can, we can live through lies or we can live through the truth. We see in Romans 1, verse 18, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. There's consequences for not believing and following the truth. And I'll finish it off with 1 Corinthians 13. Love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Yeah. Life does not, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Mm -hmm. So if we believe in the truth of the word, the truth of the word reveals to us deeper thoughts and insights in terms of what it really means. Yes. So if we go back, if we finish it up here, what is truth? What is truth? <laughs> We may know many things can have truth, but only one thing can actually be the truth. And that's with a capital T. It must originate from somewhere. It doesn't originate from us. It's outside of us, a law above the laws. You know, it's incredible that 2000 years ago when Pilate was looking directly in the eyes of the truth at the origin of truth, and he asked the question, what is truth? And the truth answered the question in John 14, 6. He says, I am the truth. What an incredible statement to make. How could a mere man, how could Jesus be truth? He couldn't be unless he was more than man, which is actually what he claimed to be. So the man, the more than man that claimed to be truth was actually more than truth. Jesus' claim was validated when we learned from Romans 1, 4 that he rose from the dead. He was resurrected. And so who was on that trial 2,000 years ago when Pilate was asking Jesus the question? Was Jesus on, on trial or was everyone else on trial? Hmm. They thought they were judging Jesus when, in fact, Jesus was judging them. 
And foundationally, we know the we know truth exists. We and the entire world have this unsor- unchanging source of truth, the word of God. We have it available to us. We can study it every day. Truth lived with us, Jesus did. Truth taught us. Truth loved us. He showed us how to live, and that glorifies him as the source through our Father in heaven. So we started this whole journey with John, with Third John. John talked about truth five different times. In verse 1, John says, whom I love in the truth. He says, whom I love in the truth. We have God and his word are the compass for which we live our lives. If we do this, if we immerse ourselves in the truth, if we immerse ourselves in Jesus, in his life and the principles he teaches and he left us, he taught us the two greatest commandments, to love God and to love others. And if we stand on that foundation, going to back to what Joe said early on, we need the foundation. Where do we start with? Love God and love others. That's the first instance of where John talks about truth in Third John. The second one, faithfulness in the truth, he says. So we should be steadfast and committed to the truth. We should be. We should be a loyal and allegiant to the truth. We should be. We should be firm and adherence to the promises of the truth. We should try our best to be. We'll fail. We'll stumble. That's okay. We should strive for that. Be firm in that. And we should be conscientious in our conviction and our drive to seek and find and live by the truth. That's the faithfulness to the truth that John is talking about in verse three. Amen. So in verse four, he says, walking in the truth, walking in the truth. That means to bring our lives into conformity with God's revealed truth. We have it available to us. We should stand firm in God's word. We should teach and learn the truth plainly and take it as a starting point in our lives for our own decisions, our own moral decisions, the moral decisions that science can't prove. You can't do by experiment. And we should reflect God's trust, trustworthiness and faithfulness in our daily lives, walking in the truth, love in the truth, faithfulness in the truth, walking in the truth. Here's one for all of us. Work together for the truth. Verse eight. Amen. So we're to love each other. We're to love others. We're to work together. We're to advance the truth. Why do we do it? We do it for Jesus. We do it for the joy in the Lord. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Amen. And finally, in verse 12, he says, even by the truth itself. And in this particular area in the scripture, he was talking about Demetrius and how faithful he was to the truth. And that that even the truth was a witness on his behalf. So we can see evidence of us living in the truth by the actions that we actually take as we live our life. So in five verses of the 14 verses in 3 John, John made it very clear to us the importance of the truth. That's why we've studied it for the last two weeks. And so nowadays, you know, many people may search for their own truth. But let me just be really clear. The Bible makes it clear that there is an absolute truth and that absolute truth is in God. Truth, truth Jesus, capital T, is the reality God has created and defined for us to live by. It all must ultimately be defined in terms of God. That is the standard, that is the compass, that is the foundation. And truth can be doctrinal, and it should be moral in our scope and how we live our lives. And that's all I have to say about truth. It only took two hours. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) That's all right. There Any was, comments yeah. on this? Any thoughts about these last couple weeks? I've really enjoyed them. I have too. Um, I do have a question though. What is happening when they start calling people that we know as mother the birthing person? Oh my God. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have one comment and I've only been here for today and not last week um, all of the concept of truth as we're discussing it here relates to religion 
I would also like to just make a point that in, in our lives on earth, the relationships we have with family and friends will definitely be enhanced and it will last forever if truth is something we all try to permit and promote every single day of our life. As it turns out, Judy and I, it's my wife, we've been married, this is our 60th year. Um, both of our kids are married decades long and doing well. And one of the reasons that happens is because the word truth has a place on earth as well, inside our life. And, it's, and Rick would probably see, uh, agree completely that <clears throat> this person's talking has had truth as be to be very important in, in the relationship with his family forever. I just thought on earth, it's got some good, good purpose as well to be truthful. People will appreciate and will love you if truth is always your effort. And what's really cool about that, it was invented by God. Yeah. He said it was invented yeah. outside of man. My, my understanding of, of why that is coming to pass is people <clears throat> are not wanting to recognize the truth of fixed genders, male and female, right. and that calling a mother a birthing person allows for the fluidity of people who, who want to call themselves female, who, who obviously will, will not ever be a birthing person because they were you know, born with a XY chromosome. And it's just a matter of, of, of trying to make what is true about gender um, a relative truth, that gender isn't fixed. And so you can start playing with words like that. Interesting. I just, I had a feeling it had something to do with trying to twist things to make it the way it'll be easier for them to slide in what they want. Yeah. And I, and I think a common strategy um, that, that is being repeated over and over and over again is you start with redefining words. Right. You start with that. The more you hear it, the more likely it'll become a reasonable concept. If you hear it enough, it makes it easier to begin to believe. Easily, even if you don't believe it, it's easier to begin to accept. Yeah. Well, and a, a common manipulation tactic is you yes. remove common reference points. Correct. Yes. You start moving everything around, it's much easier to change definitions. Yes. No, no, that's not a glass of water. You don't, that's, that's poison. Right. The hemlock is what you want. Right. Yes. It becomes much more yes. reasonable when you don't have those points of reference. That's right. That's right. Yep. Thanks, well, everyone, everyone. Thank, thank you so much for this conversation tonight. I think it's a great time to be closing in prayer. I think it's uh, bedtime for Roger, and it's really making me nervous that I'm at 7.33, and, and we're not <laughs> off yet. And so uh, um, I'm going to close us in prayer, if that's okay. Yes. Father God, I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful for everyone that's here tonight, Father. I'm thankful for the, the love and kindness that we can actually have towards each other talking about seems like any subject, Father. And I'm so thankful that we have a way in which we can be aligned and calibrated with you, Father, in terms of what you've taught us, what you've taught us through the word, Father, that gives us a foundation, a foundation that we can build upon and use and to love others, Father. So this isn't about finding ways to be combative. This isn't finding ways to have war. It is finding ways about the truth and being able to speak and convey with comfort and peace and confidence uh, to others uh, this truth in which you've revealed to the whole world, Father. It's not just to us, it's to everyone. And I just pray for everyone here I know there's a lot of things that are going on right now, Father, and I just pray that you give the guidance and direction, the health, the healing, the, the expertise of doctors, Father, that, the, that just your will is done and miracles happen, Father. And I just ask this in Jesus' name. And we all say, amen. 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 Well, y'all have a great rest of the week. It was wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to cover next week. I think I'm going to surprise you. So okay. um, we'll, we'll see what it is. I have a couple different options. So 
Good night, everyone. Good night. I'll, I'll Good see night. you in two weeks. Bye. All right, ciao.